We are back. Hello. Hey. Okay, so um, in the next section, we'll talk about parallel programming. Um, yeah. I'll move this a bit up. Okay. So what does this so, even mean? <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's a um, couple of objectives for this, but I guess um, understanding what parallel programming is, is probably the only real objective here. And then we can try it out using a couple of different libraries. But of course, those are not all the options available. So yeah, what does parallel programming mean? Um, it, the short of it is that you are running a program on multiple computers or really multiple processes on either one or more computers. So these days, essentially all laptops or essentially all computers have more than one processor available at any given yeah. time. And by default, you will be running on only one. Yeah. So this can make your code faster. But um, yeah, I guess I we guess, can, it was yeah. the theory of multiple processors. And it's sort of like a processor does one thing at once. So, well, hmm. yeah, maybe that's too can deep do in theory of computation. One calculation at any given time. But in some cases, you may be able to, to do um, two things at the same time and therefore be twice as fast. But that really depends on your on the problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I so, guess the, the first thing really to talk about is um, do you need or can you even have a parallel version of what you're doing? Mm -hmm. um, when is it useful? So yeah. the first thing when you start thinking about that is to well, I mean, you when you start thinking about it, you probably have a code that is slower than you would want, or you would want it to do more than it's doing now. Do something faster. And then the question is, is it slow because it's doing everything it can as quickly as possible, but it's just not possible to run any faster? Mm -hmm. Or is it slow because you are using something less efficient than, um, than is optimal, than is possible? Mm -hmm. So the first thing you should really do is, unless, I mean, if you haven't done it yet, um, is to profile your code and find out where it's actually running slowly, where it's actually spending time. Mm -hmm. And there's many options, but um, there's, for example, gprof for Python is really useful. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you identify those areas and then you think, um, can you make them somehow better? Can you make them faster? So. Is there a library you can use to replace that, uh, replace some Python code? Can you use a a better library? Can you use a parallel library, perhaps? Mm, um, like it's something else to do with the parallelism for you. Yeah, just yeah. If, if somebody's done it for you already, then there's no reason for you to do it. Mm -hmm. um, any Which, other low effort optimizations? Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a feeling that really these days, I've very rarely done parallelism in my work other than embarrassingly parallel. And it's mostly been other libraries that already support it and I have to use. Yeah, there's one case of a really big physics simulation where I've used, I mean, I actually written parallel code for my uh, on my own, mm -hmm. but otherwise I've actually never done it. Yeah. So, um, okay, but yeah, after that, you think about writing parallel code. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so what's next? Okay, um, we have a quick um, kind of um, introduction to a, a different paradigms of parallel code um, of parallelizing uh, your program. So the first one is called embarrassingly parallel and there's nothing really embarrassing about that, but um, sometimes you can just run two copies or many copies of your code and it will be that times that many times faster so mm -hmm. sometimes you just want to do the same thing for a hundred thousand files mm -hmm. and the things don't depend on each other in any way and then you just run 10 hundred million well not million hundred thousand um, copies of the program and it's equally good so yeah. it's that much faster and how do we do that command line i guess command line yeah um, command line script that stuff yeah okay. um yeah. you can also use um some python library to 
um, if, if you're not familiar with command line mm -hmm. wave methods for doing that. But yeah, probably command line. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But then um, somewhat more complicated um, situations. So there's shared memory parallelism. That's when the different things you want to do to those different files, for example, um, they do need to communicate with, they depend on each other in some way. So they need some information for from the other processes. And if that happens, um, maybe you can still parallelize it, but you need to really think about how it would work. And um, shared memory means that they have access to the same variables and they are running on the same computer. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, that means it, it's, um, it's fast for them to talk with each other. And um, this yeah. is mainly a different way of thinking about programming rather than uh, compared to the message passing. Um, mm -hmm. So in message passing, you write a program that runs a single copy um, of your parallel application. And then you really, you write what, what this program will send to this program and what this program will send to this program. Yeah. Um, so and in, in shared memory, those all just have access to the same variables in the code. Mm -hmm. So is shared memory easier to write? The, um, I think if you're getting started, yes. I started with message, pa message passing, and it's mm -hmm. just more natural for me to think in that way. But um, yeah. I think for mostly, especially if you're starting from a code that already works, it's much easier to uh, uh, parallelize a small section of it in shared memory, mm -hmm. because then you don't need to touch most of the code. But there's uh, one um, kind of important, but also kind of unimportant detail. Um, Python is not really meant for multiprocessing. And there is something co called a global interpreter log, which basically means that one process in Python can only have one um, interpreter running at once. You can't okay. have two Python processes interpreting the Python code at the same time. Um, within one process. So it's within like... one process, yeah. So really, it, it kind of means that there is no shared memory in Python, but mm. in it's well, not as big a deal as, as it sounds, or, because you can always use libraries that run C in the background or yeah. other languages. And you can use libraries built around, um, built, I mean, you can use libraries in Python that are built to go around this problem, mm -hmm. like uh, multiprocessing. Yeah. So, did I miss anything? Any questions before we move on? So it's like saying, I think, so in Python, you can have shared memory, but you can only do one thing at a time with that shared memory. Uh, yeah, I guess. But then yeah. why have shared? I mean, yeah. it's one process running one thing. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, you can always Although, call, like you can um, install a parallel version of whatever NumPy is calling in the back end. Yeah. Um, yeah, like actually then... things like NumPy and SciPy, they can be parallel and use shared memory because they're not running yeah. in Python, they're running in C. So yeah. So anything that runs outside Python can, yeah. um, can use shared memory parallelism in a relatively straightforward way. Yeah which is one of the reasons of using these other numerical libraries. Yeah. So yeah. use that, export your work to that, and then they can run in parallel. I mean, it's also that running um, anything that's actually interpreted, anything that's actual Python code is much slower than something that's written in C, like we already saw in the NumPy section. So mm -hmm. um, if you're calling NumPy, SciPy, Pandas, mm -hmm. that will be faster in any case. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, should we nevertheless try it out? Um, yeah. Let's say we are at a point where we've determined that we want or we need to use parallelism and we want to do it in Python. Okay. So I'll switch to my screen since okay. I believe I'm doing the demo here. Yeah. I'll... So multiprocessing sure. is a Python library that goes around the global interpreter log. Um, do you want to know how it does that? Or should we just <laughs> try it out? Can you say I mean, it, it in just one Basically, sentence? it just creates multiple processes. It, it creates multiple Python processes. And it's actually message passing. They actually send messages to each other. So, mm, OK. Um, but yeah, it, it feels very much like shared memory yeah. when you're using it. OK. So, so let's um, 
yeah, let's define yeah. a function. And this, we will want to apply this function to a huge bunch of different data. So um, okay. let's see. Um, so there is this function called map. Um, and it will do exactly that. It will apply the, we can use it to apply the square function to a list of numbers. So uh, we can try to see what comes out. Um, so this is a very common case actually that you might want to do to have a, a function and apply it to a huge bunch of data. Yeah. And okay. So yeah, it returns this map object. You have to actually ask for an element before it does any calculation. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very lazy library. <laughs> but, I think, yeah. yeah, I think one thing you're going to say, like this concept of defining a function and multiple data and you apply it, that's probably one of the most common ways of doing parallelism yeah. stuff. So like when you're thinking, I want to do that, like think of this mapping kind of thing and you'll get very far. Yeah. So this is either split, apply, combine, um, or map reduce, depending on who you ask. Um, mm -hmm. But those two, is, I mean, they're kind of the same thing. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, it, okay. We are only applying it to six numbers, but yeah. um, we can still parallelize it. Mm -hmm. And if we were doing it for a much larger set of numbers, it would be really fast. So. So let's just do that. Um, oh, um, yeah, OK. That makes sense. We're defining the data okay. first. Um, so let's import the multiprocessing. And then um, let's actually import the pool uh, function, a pool yeah. class from the multiprocessing. And library. in this case, it means a pool of workers or something. Yeah, yeah. It means so. a pool of Python processes or a pool of workers. Yeah, OK. All right. And then you get a new pool of workers using the um, by calling or creating an instance of the pool class. And pool has map. So just like Python has its own map function, pool.map um, is the impl multi processing implementation of that. So you can run the same thing as um, the map function. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it will run on multiple processes. Let's see data. I guess we need yeah, to save so, the output. Yeah, we, we do want to print it or save it somehow. OK, it worked. Yeah, it worked. OK, so um, there is an exercise where we do it for a much bigger set of data. Yeah. Um, I think we'll do that at the same time as the MPI exercise. Yeah. Or you oh, can no. do it. Yeah. Sorry. There's HackMD questions. So multiprocessing can call several instances of Python and combine it at the end. Basically, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it starts multiple interpreters and like sends the data to there and it runs and then it sends it back. So there is an important limitation actually that comes from that. Um, you have uh, multiprocessing needs to be able to take the function and send it to the other processes. So the other processes are running Python, but they're not running this Python notebook. They're just running um, this multiprocessing library mm -hmm. somehow listening mm -hmm. for commands. So um, only we have the function and the workers, worker processes don't. Um, so that can sometimes cause some problems. Um, we'll see if we'll run into, into any. Um, yeah. But essentially, the, the function needs to be in the current namespace, and it needs to be possible to turn it into a string mm -hmm. and send it. Yeah, OK. OK, so we had this exercise that we'll do at the same time as the next one, I guess. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. OK. All right, so, so um, next we have an in, a quick introduction to MPI. Um, MPI is um, I'm the message passing interface. Ah, all right. OK. So MPI is the message passing interface. I just mentioned the message passing, passing paradigm. Um, and that's what MPI does. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I already uh, kind of I, I very quickly mentioned that you th think about writing MPI code in a quite a different way. So in MPI, you write code for a single process um, and 
you have them send messages to each other. So when you start an MPI program, it will run multiple processes. Uh, each will get a number and you can use those numbers to figure out what, you're, what this process is supposed to do and what data it needs to send to the others. Mm -hmm. They all have their own memory, so they cannot, um, like here we are actually referring uh, to the same data here um, in the multiprocessing. Mm -hmm. But in MPI, they just all have their own, own data. You uh, can't refer to the other one's data unless you send it first. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I guess that's mostly what you need. Um, if you don't have any MPI library installed, well, I, okay. Um, if you install it from the Conda environment, you probably it probably does install an MPI library. Um, mm -hmm. If you just install um, MPI for Python, um, MPI for Py, you will also need to install some MPI library in your system. So that that's just another warning. But um, so we're you saying almost certainly already have it in the Conda environment. We're saying it's better to install it from Conda, or mm, yeah, no. okay. Um, at least for now, um, yeah, yeah. If you if you're working on a package that uses MPI, then you'll need to do, take that into account. Yeah. So um, okay. it's probably best to just go through an example. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll come and back. And this to my example screen. is a very it's very commonly used. You may have seen it before if you've taken any uh, parallel processing courses. It's uh, one where we evaluate pi by throwing darts at a dart port and just basically randomly um, randomly throwing points into a square and um, seeing how many land inside a circle. Yeah. And from that, we can figure out the value of pi. OK, so that's what the sample function does. Um, I guess we don't need to go into that much yeah. more detail about that. Okay. And then we have these um, yellow lines. Um, you were about to say something? Oh, no. Go ahead. OK. Um, so these yellow lines here are MPI things. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the first one is here. So you have to import MPI um, to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. But. Um, once you've done that, you will have access to this, um, well, com world. Um, I'm not going to go too much into it. It's something MPI needs. Um, it defines what processes exist. Oh, yeah. It it tells MPI what other processes you have started. And this is the size is how many processes there are. And rank is the number of this process. So it's kind of the name of this process. Um, okay, so it's like MPI starts and then there's size number of different workers yeah. which are communicating and then you're yeah. one of them. You are one of them and mm -hmm. you can identify yourself by this rank. Yeah. So uh, what we do here is um, check that there are more than one process, more than one process um, and we mm -hmm. divide the number of, um, we are calling this sample function this and task times. Mm -hmm. But if you have more than one worker, then um, one of them calls it this many times. Yeah. Oh, end time. Overall well, end times end. and end task is how many okay. times we need to call it. OK. Yeah, OK. All right. And um, well, then we just we call it. We gather the data, um, collect the data on this process. And then at the end, we need to communicate. So now. Each process has some data, but they don't know anything about the other processes really mm -hmm. at this point. So they need to send their data to some place to collect them in one place. And here we decide to send it to process number zero. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we have, we're printing out what happens um, so that you can easily see uh, when you run this. And then process number zero actually does the estimation estimating, uh, calculating pi and printing out the result. Okay. But I guess the important bit really is here. Um, so everybody does only a part of the work. Then they only have a part of the result and they need to communicate it to one single place. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess it's like a very careful demo? balance. Dividing up the work is sometimes easy, but then sending and yeah. receiving it, if there's a slight mismatch there, like someone sends some data and it's not received by others, then I guess that's that's really very bad. bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, if you send or receive data in MPI and the other process doesn't know about it, it will just hang there and wait until mm -hmm. you um, stop the broker. <laughs> okay. And this this is, I think, something that happens often in parallel programming. It's really yeah. easy to get messed up and then stuff doesn't run or runs wrong and it's super hard to debug. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so should we give some uh, Yeah, let's give some time to do the exercises so you can, you can pick the order. Um, yeah. Should we give maybe even 20 minutes or 25 minutes? I think these are going to be yeah, really interesting exercises to do. Yeah. Um, um, so 25 minutes and then, okay. We will want to go to the desk section if we have time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so 25 minutes is until 40. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. And I'd really encourage you if you, um, yeah, like try these exercises because they are I'm going to show the first, um, these are quite good and something quite common if you haven't done it before, especially multiprocessing. Okay. Um, good luck then. See you later. We'll chat via HackMD. So we're back. This was certainly an interesting exercise session. So, um, yeah, plenty of, of problems getting things to run, but also sometimes it works well. So I was wondering, could some of the problems with the multiprocessing pool on some windows be if it's a university managed computer and they have some sort of security policy that prevents it from spawning new uh, processes. Like it's it would, possible. Like I wouldn't think that it would affect security that much since you're still running things, but hmm. It is a program automatically spawning processes rather than threads. But yeah. um, some people were using Threadbull and that did work on Windows. So mm -hmm. at least there is a solution for some cases. Yeah. Um, so if it's not working on the Windows things, I think there's not much we can do right now. So this is something maybe go work with your colleagues and try to debug it and see. We can try to debug it over the next few weeks also, and who knows if we'll find something. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, um, so should yeah. we quickly demonstrate a way of a better way of doing it, you could say? Sure. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe not always a better way, uh, but Dask is a very useful library and it mm -hmm. is worth showing here at the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, You've got the screen. Yeah. Um, so essentially what Dask does is um, if you're using NumPy, it makes parallelization easy for you, at least for many um, familiar NumPy operations. Mm -hmm. So um, Dask has its own array class, but when you do operations on, on those task arrays, the operations get done in parallel. So they're just distributing, it is automatically distributing the data, doing the mm -hmm. operations, and then when you need it, it returns you to the right place. Um, yeah. I yeah. already said that, um, I mean, you can use parallel backends for NumPy and so on. Um, when there is a library that does the thing you want, and it does it well in parallel, um, then you should of course, use it rather than try to write something yourself. Yeah, because this is a good example of doing it in parallel using the NumPy interface um, 
doing things automatically for you so you don't have to worry about it. So should we just do the demonstration? Yeah, um, sure. There is Sounds also good. a optional exercise that we will not have time to do, but you can take a look. Mm -hmm. um, should I do the demonstration or do you want to? Maybe it's good if you do it. OK. Um, I'm not actually 100% sure I have Dask installed. But I can, of course, always run this command. Yeah. And uh, I think it's there. It says it's there. OK, great. So, so we have yeah. Dask. It's nice that you can run pip directly from Jupyter. Um, OK, so what we do is import um, dask.array. Okay. OK. Now we have dask.array. And we call it DA here. So um, this is very similar to numpy.array. So we take, uh, for, for example, to create a, a random array, we would do dask.random.random, which is the way it happens also in NumPy. There is a random.random .random function. Um, we give it the size. So let's say 10,000 times 10,000. Yeah, that's about right. And, and we need an additional parameter. Or rather, we should provide it. It makes sense to provide an additional parameter, mm -hmm. which is um, chunks. Did I spell it right? Nope. No, it's correct. Chunks. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. will tell it to split the array into um, sections, into chunks in both directions. So we'll do chunks of size 1,000. Um, do you know if these are the chunk size or the number of chunks? I'm not sure. Mm, that's a good question. I'd hope it's the chunk size for what's here. Yeah. But chunks kind of to me means number of chunks, but okay, we'll see. Yeah. Um, so we can do operations. Um, so we can do operations that work in NumPy. For example, x plus x works. Uh, we can take the transpose um, and let's also subtract mm -hmm. the mean. So the mean function works. Um, we'll take the mean across the um, first axis. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this should run. Ooh, this is interesting. OK. Whoa. So maybe demonstrate. Um, <laughs> I'll demonstrate this first. So when you display oh. a Dask array, it will show you um, the size of the array in bytes, the size of each chunk and a nice graphical representation of the chunks and the whole array. OK, it's type float 64. Um, this is a Jupyter thing, um, by the way. In, in a command line, you wouldn't get graphics like this. OK, um, so this is okay, like sort but of we have describing. 100 chunks, which is, okay. so we have 10 times 10 chunks. The size of each chunk is 1,000 times 1,000. Mm -hmm. So that's what you expected. And 100 tasks, because so. Uh, when you do an operation for an array like this, it will get split into a hundred separate tasks that will be run on the processes that you have available. Um, I only have four, so it will, of course, run many tasks okay. for each processor. OK, now we can run this operation. And let's put it in another, um, let's call it R for result, or let's just call it result. OK, and if we try to print result. It, it doesn't fortunately print all the numbers. There's a huge num amount of numbers here. Mm -hmm. It just prints some information about it. Yeah. OK, we can. OK. So there are numbers there, though. So let's do um, 0, comma 0, I think, is the syntax in NumPy. OK. Mm -hmm. OK, and it shows. Array eight bytes. Okay. Yeah, I shouldn't go off script because I don't remember how it's a to single get the number, number from here. If you do print directly, uh, yeah, when you have three minutes time left, uh, that's not the right <laughs> time to go off script. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. So anyway, it. Mm, yeah. So, well, is this the conclusion of the day? What's the summary here? Yes, this is the conclusion. There is a short section on task 
task queues um, that you can read. But yeah, um, so the key points, pure Python is not great for highly parallel code, uh, but you can do it. There are interfaces for libraries that do things really well. Um, so you can use them and usually that's enough. Um, and then you can combine vectorized um, functions. So NumPy, SciPy, Pandas functions with, um, with uh, the existing parallel strategies in different ways. Um, so Dask is a great way um, or using some back, proper backend library is a great way. And that will get you very far. But there are, there are options if you need to go further. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. Or most important things. And I guess parallel computing is this like huge field which has many different tools and techniques and all kinds of things. So um, if you start needing parallel things, this is just the smallest introduction to get you started, but there's plenty more you need to learn yourself. Um, I found the way to get the numbers from the Dask array, by the way. Ah, OK. Do you want to show it's us? A, um, yeah, if you want to switch to my screen. OK, so, there we go. Um, I had this, this result object. It didn't actually compute anything yet. This is something I definitely should have mentioned. If, um, I'm not sure if it's in our results. Um, so you have to call the compute function to get the numbers. Mm -hmm. So it's and like. There we are. Until you do compute, it's not actually computing anything. Yeah. It just like it's constructing the um, constructing essentially a code to um, to compute it, the instructions to compute it. Um, you can slice it before you compute it, and that will make it much faster to compute. Yeah. Okay. That compared to this. 